my pleasure to present to you our report. In fact, uh, I was a member of this International Commission on Agriculture and Climate Change. And maybe if you have got now my slides. Yes. Have you got them? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, my point was to show you our conclusions and on each conclusion or a few of the conclusions, not to be too long, uh, to show what could be the role of global donors in, uh, in what will happen. So first, to start with uh, some facts, in fact. Our planet today <coughs> has sufficient food for all the people that live on it, but at the same time, you have a billion people that go hungry and uh, 1.5 billion of a weight. Of course, all of you know about that, but uh, it's always useful to remember that uh, the situation is quite paradoxical. It is estimated at the same time that a third of food produced for human consumption is lost or wasted across the global food system. And in fact, today, if we may say that in one sentence, Food insecurity afflicts communities throughout the world, but mainly because of inequalities and poverty that prevent assured access to food supplies. So, of course, when we look at the coming years with an increased population, with food prices that will uh, maybe rise further and become more volatile, with extreme weather events such as high temperature drought and floods that will be more frequent. Well, we need to be very conscious that uh, we have to think together about the situation and about what we should do. So my next slide is about the commission. So who are the people that uh, did that work and uh, got uh, the conclusions that you have worked about? So we come from all the major regions of the world. There is a wide range of scientific backgrounds in agriculture, in climate, in ecology, in economics, in trade and nutrition. We acted as independent uh, people in our personal capacity. We did not represent our institutions. And our mandate was quite clear. It was to articulate scientific findings on the potential impact of climate change on agriculture and food security globally and regionally. And it was, of course, to try to identify the most appropriate action to achieve food security in the context of climate change for the coming years. So in the next slide, it's almost impossible to read, but uh, it seems to explain to you how we have worked. In fact, the report represents the expert opinion of, of uh, 13 commissioners. But uh, in fact, we worked on the basis of our experience, informed by the findings of 16 recent and authoritative assessments of climate change and food security. And uh, we, in fact, did some special studies on two topics, uh, food price volatility and eating patterns. And then the report was developed with discussions well, physical or video discussions over a period of 12 months with iterative review by the commissioners and a final external review. So, in fact, it is always very difficult to pretend to understand and to give advice on such a big topic, but we try to be there to inform global policy processes. So, we issued seven recommendations. So on the next slide, yes, you have the list of uh, the four first recommendations. In fact, our collective choice, it is our opinion related to agriculture and food system must be revisited. Sustainable agriculture and greater efficiency in the food system is a critical part of the response. So as you will see our recommendations, are there with very concrete and urgent actions that are suggested to be implemented by a constellation of actors. 
governments, international institutions, investors, agricultural producers, consumers, food companies, researchers, and donors, of course. And on the next slide, you have the three other recommendations. So the next slide, please. Yes, so you see that uh, there are um, quite ambitious recommendations. So I will come back to some of them to underline the role global donors could have to help their realization. If I come back to recommendation one, the next slide. In fact, it suggests to establish a work program on mitigation and adaptation in agriculture in accordance with the principles of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And our target is to have a first step with inclusion of agriculture in the mainstream of international climate change policy. Then the second target is to make sustainable and climate-friendly agriculture central to green growth and the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit that is coming soon. Then we underline the need to finance early action to drive change in agricultural production systems towards increasing resilience to weather variability and shocks while contributing as soon as possible and significantly to mitigating climate change. This includes supporting national climate risk assessment, developing mitigation and adaptation strategies, and program implementation. We suggest to develop common platforms at all levels, global, regional, national levels, for a coherent, uh, coherent dialogue and policy action related to climate change, agriculture, crisis response, and food security. This includes fostering country levels, coalitions for food security and building resilience, and particularly in countries most vulnerable to climate shocks. So to give examples, to implement this recommendation, global donors could encourage investment in integrated agricultural adaptation and mitigation, help such country-level coalitions to be put in place, especially in countries most vulnerable. And some examples are already in place, for instance, with the Green Climate Fund, uh, with uh, 100 billion per year by 2020 for mitigation and adaptation in developing countries, least developed country fund, adaptation fund, nationally appropriate mitigation actions, and so on, or I could quote the global environment facilities or the official development assistance. So, it's to say that some actions are already in place, but uh, much more has to be done. If I try to go to the second recommendation, it's the next slide. In fact, this recommendation is about implementing and strengthening the existing G8 L'Aquila program and commitments, including long-term commitments for financial and technical assistance. It's to enable UNFCCC to prioritize sustainable agricultural program. It's to adjust national research and development budget and to build integrated scientific capacity. For example, developing nutritious non-grain crops and reducing post-harvest losses. It's to increase knowledge of best practices and access to innovation. North, south, 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 or cross-commodity or farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchanges, or um, action directed to women farmers. The global donors should use L'Aquila as a cornerstone for increasing investment to boost sustainable agricultural practices and to organize financing around nationally owned frameworks. 
There again, there are already some actions in place, as the commitment of uh, 20 billion US dollars over three years uh, for agricultural development in impoverished countries, that was the initiative of L'Aquila, of course. Or the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program. So here again, some actions have started, and I would like to take the example of Kenya on the next slide, please. So, in fact, it's very interesting local action that has been quite efficient to improve smallholders' market access and production efficiency. The target was to help East Africa dairy development project with Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda actions. And several partners are involved in that action with International Livestock Research Institute, the World Agroforestry Center, Haifa International, TechnoServe, or Nestle, and it has been funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And in fact, it boosted the incomes of millions of smallholders in East Anglia, just with actions on improved breeding technologies, animal nutrition practices, and a better access to the market. If I go to our recommendation four, it's to target uh, some populations that are most vulnerable to climate changes and food insecurity. Of course, to develop funds to provide rapid relief when there are extreme events, to moderate food price fluctuations by sharing country information and production forecasts, to know about the stocks, to create and support safety nets and other programs to help vulnerable populations, to establish emergency food reserves, or to support platforms uh, to integrate all the data and to coordinate the global donor programs and policies. And here again, the donors should design large-scale programs to increase incomes and market access for poor producers or to encourage local participatory programs that respond to the needs of poor rural population. So it's necessary to create and support those platforms that should systematically integrate climate change risk management adaptation and mitigation co-benefits, and improved local nutritional outcomes. And here again, there are already some good examples. GP, GDPRD, CGR Fund Council, uh, that have platforms already in construction. A practical example is on the next slide, with uh, the programs that involve the Ethiopian government and um, a program that is called the Productive Safety Net Program. It takes a development-oriented approach to food aid that creates an assured governmental safety net and uh, so a greater predictability for smallholders. It combines international donor funding, it's over uh, 1.27 billion US dollars over the last six years, and the government supplies infrastructure, labor, and inputs that are evaluated uh, 500,000 US dollars. And in fact, it looks at uh, the workers, whether they are able bodied adults, then they are receive transfers of cash and food for their participation in labor intensive public works while other households receive unconditional transfers. And the public works initiative improve soil quality, water supply, ecological condition, infrastructure, and social services. And so now it is in its third phase and operational in 317 administrative districts, and it is reaching 7.7 .7 million beneficiaries. 
complementary programs address household asset building, community infrastructure development, and the World Food Program and other partners have developed, have developed a stream of technical advice and a stakeholder platform that provides oversight. So that's a good example of a very practical and successful common initiative. If I look at recommendation five, it's the next slide. There we suggest to reshape food access and consumption patterns to ensure the basic nutritional needs and to foster healthy and sustainable eating habits worldwide. In fact, now everybody knows that we have to address at the same time under nutrition and hunger and of a nutrition around all the regions of the world. So we have to promote positive changes in the variety and quantity of diets through innovative education campaigns, through economic incentives that align the marketing practices of retailers and processors with public health and environmental goals. We could as well promote and support a set of evidence-based sustainability metrics and standards to monitor and evaluate food security, nutrition and health practices and technologies across supply chain, agricultural productivity efficiency, resource use and environmental impact, and food system cost and benefits. And this could include, for instance, providing consumers with clear labeling. If I try to, to show you on the next slide, the evolution of the world diet, I mean, each dot, each set of dots, I mean, a green, a red, and a blue, is linked with one country. So there you see the diet composition for 178 countries uh, during uh, that uh, time lag. And it's uh, tw uh, 2005 to 2007. And in fact, you see that the tendency is the same everywhere. That is to say that when uh, the country develop, in fact, the consumption of cereals and vegetables decreases, while the consumption of sugar, of fats, and animal products increases. So this transition has uh, happened in developed countries of our century, and a similar but greatly accelerated pattern can be seen in Asia, Central, and Latin America, and to a lesser extent in Africa, where these diet, same diet transitions are occurring within 20 years in emerging countries and within 40 years in developing countries. And so there again, and it's at the next slide, global donors can contribute to, to funding specific programs. And there I take the example of a program, a very practical and useful program that has been put in place by WHO and FAO. So first, they worked on such initiatives to increase both production and consumption of fruits and vegetables. The first program was put in place in Southeast Asia, then in Portuguese-speaking countries, and in 2007, it was put in place in 18 French-speaking countries that are now involved through Africa. And so again, that's a very practical example of what could be done very efficiently. If I come to recommendation six, it is uh, the recommendation to reduce lost and waste in food systems. Of course, because uh, improving harvest and port harvest management, food storage and transport can make a big difference. Uh, developing uh, integrating policies and programs that can reduce waste in food supply chains, economic innovation to enable low income producers to store food during period of excess, excess supply, and to create obligations for distributors to separate and reduce food waste, to reduce waste you have to create incentives to help people to 
know how to redirect food waste to other purposes. And again, governments and global donors could develop local, relevant, integrated models for reducing food loss and waste, direct financing towards infrastructure improvements uh, as roads, energy sources, markets, infrastructure for storage, for packing, for transport, and all those investments can provide the foundation for subsequent private sector investments. The donors can build capacity for post-harvest loss reduction, including knowledge of handling practices, safety standards, access to tools and supplies, information about costs and benefits. There could be uh, training and extension programs with follow-ups, and in uh, middle and high-income countries, a use of a mix of public campaigns, advertising, taxes, regulation, guidelines, improve labeling, can help reduce consumer and food service sector waste. If I try to show you in the next slide, where are the losses and waste? You see on the left, I hope, the consumption and pre-consumption stages and the losses in different regions. The consumption is red and the producing to retailing losses are green. And on the right, you see the part of initial several production that is lost or wasted at different stages of the food supply chain in different regions of the world. Of course, it doesn't take into account the, trans uh, the transformation factor linked to animal feed. But you see that depending on the region of the world, the places where the losses and waste occur are very different. So there again, and it's the next slide, the global donors can work uh, with government or can take initiatives that are very efficient. And we took the example of what has been done in the United Kingdom where approximately 22% of household food and drink is, at the, is wasted at the moment. So they Dr. have Guyou. acted... Yes. Yes, we're, we need to have time for discussion after this. So I would ask you to okay, try... Okay, so I will go. I don't want to miss okay. recommendation number seven, though. <laughs> Yes, you will, meet, uh, you will miss a few of them. So I suggest to go to the next slide then. Okay. So the role of the global donors, of course, we could give a lot of examples, but time is uh, missing, so I won't do that. And I just go to the next slide to thank you for your attention and to open the discussion. <laughs> okay. Well, I... Thank you very much. No, no one ever listens to me and reacts that rapidly in my experience, but I appreciate it very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we do have a, a number of questions here, and I'd like to open it up to the, to the audience here to have your questions now that you have a direct possibility. I would also like to mention that there are so many people on the live streaming of this that some people are having difficulty uh, watching you. We had uh, our technicians are working very hard to accommodate uh, more than the 300 that are already watching. And there, there are quite a few. So pe those of you who can hear me but not see anything, please be patient. Uh, we're trying to get you uh, onto our live streaming. And I congratulate you, Dr. Yu, that you are so popular that you overload our systems. <laughs> okay. oh, thank you very much. You're it's welcome. because I've been quick. Ah, yes. It must be. Okay, <laughs> please. Reactions from the floor. Questions? Hello? Yes. Uh. Hi. Um, we've had a couple of uh, tweets going on online, and one thing that's been retweeted a couple of times was uh, one of the, the quotes from you, Marion, which was, inequality is at, is at the root of food security. So I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that, please. Yes, of course. And I'm sure that you share that opinion, that today, in theory, you have the quantity of, of food that is necessary on our planet for all the inhabitants. But of course, the situation is very different from 
a situation of satisfaction. Uh, in our, on average, we have uh, 3,000 kilocalories per person per day that is available. But in fact, when you look at the OECD average or the South uh, Sub Africa uh, uh, average, it's very different. Uh, so the first clue is the problem of access. And Amartya Sen described that quite well, in fact. And of course, you have the political trouble, the war trouble that uh, have to be taken into account. And at the same time, the economic access. And what is very interesting is there, agriculture, in a way, is a double solution. Because most of the people that suffer from hunger are poor farmers or poor people without land. And if you improve the production of agriculture, then they can go out from hunger. And at the same time, it restarts the development of the rural zone and it helps the situation quite widely around them. So, in fact, today, I think our common target is to fight inequalities and to fight poverty. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there are not many in this room who would disagree with that. Yeah, okay, we have another question, please. This Is this working? Yeah. Uh, my name is Hanna Wetterstrand. I'm working for the Swedish Cooperative Center as well, um, as a former uh, person who asked the question. Uh, I, I'm uh, especially interested in, in the question related to price uh, uh, volatility in, in food and whether you could collect the recommendations that came from your report. I heard you saying that uh, raising the importance of countries sharing information about the prospects of harvest, etc. But as far as I know, it, um, it's often very difficult to know uh, or to predict. And, and it's also related to a lot of other factors like uh, oil prices, etc. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if you had any more recommendations that you could highlight on that, because I think that's a very serious and problematic issue. I'm thinking of, for instance, the, the increased speculation in food, etc., and the involvement of the financial sector in that. Yes. Yes, it, it is a very interesting question, because in fact, you, you remember that a few years ago, let's say two years ago, even two years ago, volatility was looked at as a necessity of the market. That is to say, it was a way to adapt uh, the offer and the demand of food in a way. But now we have an abnormal volatility, let's say. So uh, you will see that we will publish um, a scientific article because we did a special job on that topic, a, a special work to try to understand the new sources of volatility. And of course, you have quoted uh, a few of those new sources. That is to say, well, the fact that you have new actors on the market, on the financial market, involving agricultural commodities, the link that can be done now between energy prices market and the agricultural commodities market, and a very nervous and stresses reaction of uh, the financial markets, even when it is linked to commodity, uh, com commodity prices. And so if I, so that is about the diagnosis, of course, and you will see that we have written an article uh, that will uh, underline the di diagnosis more precisely. And then which solutions could we recommend? And maybe you noticed in 2008 that even when the international market um, was no more in crisis. In 32 countries, the prices remain high for quite a long time. And of course, it was possible because there was no information that uh, the crisis was over. And of course, those 32 countries were mainly very poor countries. And so we are convinced that information is a very efficient tool to fight speculation, abnormal speculation. So that's why we recommend an information tool on the situation of the market, on the situation of the stocks, 
And as you know, on the G20 meeting last year, uh, some countries agreed about that, but for some countries, they thought it was too uh, strategic information to give it and to share it. So it will need time to convince all the countries that this information is needed. But I we think it's very important that this information is given to everybody so that there is no artificial panic on the market. And of course, prediction of the harvest is quite important so that you can see that the situation, even if you have a crisis somewhere in the world, that uh, it will be sufficient altogether. And there we have tools of prediction that are in place more and more uh, linked to uh, satellite uh, images uh, most of the time. And uh, it will be again a tool against abnormal speculation. So yes, we have suggested a diagnosis and uh, some recommendations to fight against it. And rules of the financial markets belong to those recommendations. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. I would like to say that all of those who are presenting via video and our own uh, respondents here will be available online for a, perhaps a group discussion towards the end. So this isn't your absolute last chance to ask. But I think we have one more question from the floor. My name is Gunnel Axelsson, the Candidate Church of Sweden. And uh, the name of the commission itself, and uh, it is Sustainable Agriculture. And you're also talking about sus uh, sustainable intensification in terms of increasing production. Now, uh, of course, sustainable is a word that is used and defined in many different ways. And, and uh, I noticed that in recommendation three, you're talking about multi multi-benefit farming, about minimizing ecosystem degradation and community design programs, which I would say, coming in from the NGO side, uh, would be uh, elements of what we often talk about as agroecological approaches, where you put an emphasis on, on optimized use of local resources before turning to external input. Uh, my question now is how the Commission has been um, approaching the, the definition of sustainable agriculture. You're right. I mean, we all talk about sustainability, but we need, every time we talk about that, first to spend some time being sure that we have the same conception of sustainability. So uh, we suppose that sustainability is to provide the quantity while being very careful about the environmental and social and economic conditions of this problem. And uh, so we took some examples, uh, maybe to be more clear. Uh, our sustainability so has several components, and we, we gave the example of the soil actions, for instance. That is to say, if, if you have a lively soil, then it prevents erosion, and at the same time, it gives more production. We, we took the example of uh, the melt, you know, the agroforestry, uh, experiments. We took several examples like that when you try at the same time to increase the global production and to be very careful about the sustainability of the biodiversity, water, air quality and soil quality. So we tried to take it into its more complete conception. Thank you very much. It answers your question. I, I think it does, <laughs> or we will ask you further questions later on. Uh, thank you very much for your input. Obviously, this is an area that you are extremely interested in, both uh, intellectually and as a human being, and you're very good at your yes. subject. <laughs>